Hello everyone, welcome back once again. I am Nicodemus Kane. Today is December the 20th of 2022. Sorry, my uh, throat's a little raw. I'm not coughing anymore, which is nice. And so far today, my nose has not given me too many problems. <clears throat> but for anyone that is even remotely followed this channel understands that once I start talking everything starts falling apart so we'll see how far we can go um, before before I have to pause but today we're gonna read Jeremiah 17 <clears throat> I said yesterday that I had thought that we were going to be reading it yesterday but there was um that it was a bit of uh, synchronicity that was happening that somebody had posted something on Twitter about Jeremiah 17 about the heart being deceitful and I had said that you know it's Jeremiah 17 9 and I thought that it was you know kind of like the the passages lining up with the things that I see in the real world, which has been happening a lot since I started reading Isaiah. And it's continuing through Jeremiah. And I'm sure that it will continue through Ezekiel as well. Um, but it is just one of those things that it seems like since we've been reading these books, people have been talking about these books. Now I definitely know it's not it's it's not because of me. It's not because they're coming to my channel and they're, you know, looking at my channel and they're saying, "Oh, hey, you know, this guy's no. It's it's definitely not that." And it's definitely not because I am seeing other people talk about it. We were led to read these 3 after the Psalms because these three books point out the lying and deceptive evils that we practice every day that a lot of people don't know about. That's one of the reasons why I did it. So just so we're all at that understanding, this there's, there's no... What do you want to call it? Ulterior motives, and I'm not, like, copying anybody else. It was what it was. And I keep seeing other people talk about it. But like I said, it's, it's not like people are coming. Of course, now, I'd, I would understand that now definitely people are talking about Jeremiah just because of Christmas. Well, you got five days left. Do I even get a day off? I don't even know if I get a day off. I probably don't. <laughs> we probably don't even get like Friday or, or Monday off. Knowing my job. <clears throat> so it's not like I'm worried about it, but you know, it it would be nice to have a day off that I can go back up to my mom's house and keep cleaning up her stuff you know we still have we still have her house we have to worry about we still have her storage shed and um, we still have not gotten a hold of a probate lawyer and I don't know why I really don't know why I'm gonna have to ask my wife about that anyways but yes, you would be you would be hearing a lot about Jeremiah, especially this time of year. Because like I said, Jeremiah absolutely points out the things that we do in this world. We shouldn't be doing them. God tells us over and over again, don't do these things. God tells us over and over again, tells us over and over again that we a lot of people do these things because they revel in doing these things. They take pride in it. 
They enjoy their wickedness, their evil, their deceitful hearts. They will wear it out on the streets with pride. And God says, when you do these things, I will remove your protection. I will send those men that are chomping at the bit to get a hold of you. The what the what the Psalms called the men in high places that laid snares and traps for my people. Those men that from the beginning of time all they have wanted to do was to enslave and hurt and kill. He says, I will remove your protection and I will just let them run right over you. So much so to the point that I will weaken you so that they can run over you because you chose to disobey. Because no matter how much I tried, you just wouldn't listen. I will always keep a remnant, and they will be able to get away and flee and do whatever. But for those of my people that they wanted to go out in the streets and dance and party and do all the crap and and just be stupid, there is all of that does nothing for you. It does not profit you. And if God continues to let that happen, what will what it will do is it will snowball onto everybody else. And it would be one completely wicked world. That there would be no law. There would be no truth, no righteousness, nothing. Which is pretty much where we're we're heading. Remember, where uh, Christ said that it was as in the days of Noah. The days of Noah were so bad that God had to step in. Had God not stepped in, there would be nothing left. He would have had to have wiped it completely and started over. Some people say he should have, but. He gave us a chance. But we're getting back to that point. And again, everything we've read, everything I've read through, says the same exact things that they used to do. So we have to listen to it and understand that... We cannot be ignorant of this world anymore. We know. We know what it means when the Bible tells us you should not be worshiping trees. You should not be worshiping false idols. You should not be doing this, doing that. We have to know that these things are definitely not what God wants for us. And he he wants us all to understand through the word, not just through, you know, Joe Schmo Nicodemus Cain sitting sitting at his desk talking into a microphone. He wants you to know through his word that he doesn't want this for anybody. That this profits us nothing. It does nothing for us. And it is lies and it is deceit. And I wrote it down, I underlined it, and I wrote it down on a post-it note so that I can have it. And we talked about Jeremiah 16, 19 yesterday where it says that the Gentiles shall come from the ends of the earth 
and shall say to God, Surely we have inherited the lies of our fathers, vanity and things wherein there is no profit. It's the lies. We're here trying to find the truth. We're trying to find the truth in all things. So with that being said, let's uh, let's read Jeremiah 17. And uh, let's find out what truth the Father has for us. Again, I am I'm a little stopped up. I'm not so bad right now. It's my throat more than anything else. It's definitely rough. Um, I think it just hurts more than anything else. My my lungs feel clean. I think whatever whatever it was that was in my lungs, I definitely coughed it out. So that's not a problem. It's just my throat is so raw. But I'm doing my best to uh, doing my best to get through it. And I will. I mean, it's just it's a cold, you know. See, you they pop up, you spend about a week with them, and then they go away, and you feel like a 110% on the back end of them, and you're just like, oh, it's so nice. <clears throat> it's just the it's just the getting through it part it sucks. All right, Jeremiah chapter 17. I almost said 13 for whatever reason. Jeremiah 17. The sin of Judah is written with pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. Whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. And there's Pilcrow on verse 5, so we're going to go back up to the top. <clears throat> and for anyone that's that's new, which I don't even know who could be coming in here that's new, um, I read down to the Pilcrows. The Pilcrows are those little backwards P's that you will see in your, your King James Version. I don't know if the new versions have them or not. That signifies the beginning of a new thought, the beginning of a new paragraph, a stopping point, if you will. You know, some some Bibles don't have them, and people will read straight from one verse into the next verse and not understand that these are two different concepts that are separated by a break. We've seen that sometimes it works amazingly that if you stop right at that point and take all the concepts, all of the context of the previous verses, it works perfectly. Other times it doesn't work so well. There's been some times where it's like you put a pilcrow right there, but it's continuing thought, and breaking that thought kind of breaks the understanding, and it gets a little weird. But we read to the pilcrows. Because I'm sure even in even in Hebrew, even in ancient Hebrew, they had to have some kind of a line break to, to make you understand this is where the thought, the old thought stops and the new thought starts. And I remember when I first started reading the Bible, there were people that were saying, you should not read it all the way through. If you just read it straight through from front to back with without taking a breath, you're going to miss a lot. And there were a couple of times where you know I was listening to uh, I'd put the U or I'd put the Bible on YouTube and I'd listen to it on the headphones and they just read it straight through. They never once even 
you know, considered paragraph breaks. They just, they'd go right through. And it's true. You miss a lot. You will skim right over something. And it's like when you come back to it and you consider those pill crows, you consider the, you consider taking, you know, those four verses in context, really understanding them, you, you, you tend to have the meanings pop out of the words. So it's, it's, I'm not going to tell people how to read their Bible. I'm not going to tell people how to interpret their Bible. This is just me talking. Um, remember this is, I'm just Joe Schmo. I'm just out here trying to figure it out for myself. I'm not a Bible scholar by any means, shape or form. I do understand that a lot of people that I've heard and listened to, they will tell me that we have to interpret the Bible in a very specific way so that none of these things come against us. As in... <clears throat> You have to interpret the Bible so that you will not be... What was the one? Somebody was saying you have to be able to, to, to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, and have somebody make you understand the Bible so that you will not be forced to be under the law of God. So I'm not forced to be under the law of anything. God said that he is going to write our write the law into our hearts to our heads and that if we follow his commands the basic rules that he set out for us then we will be just fine why do i need to have to read the bible in a specific way in order to make sure that i don't fall Sorry, there's a little cough there. Why do I have to read the Bible in a specific way so that I don't fall under the laws of man? That sounds to me like you are you are reading the Bible so that you can find a way out of the laws of God. That's what it sounds like to me. I don't, I, you know... Again, that's the stuff that I heard. I mean, you get to you get to the back of the Bible where, you know, you start talking about, you know, whether or not he, whether or not Christ made all animals clean to eat. And, you know, everybody wants to point at very specific things. And you're just like, yeah, but that's not the book. That's not what the book says. The context of every single time where you say that he made animals clean to eat, if you just keep reading... They, spe they specify. They tell you straight out, no, that's not what it means. What? You know, you're, you're, twisting the, you're twisting the word to fit your worldview. It's like Jeremiah, Jeremiah 10. It talks about not going into the, to the forest to pull a tree. I don't care if you think that the one line, the work of the workman means that you have to carve the tree into an idol you're still bringing a tree into your house decorating with decorating it with silver and gold and worshiping it how do you not see that but you want to say that that has to be in a very specific way so that you can enjoy christmas and then you want to give me every single excuse why you think that doesn't apply to you. But it absolutely applies to you because you're celebrating it. And then you want to tell me that God knows your heart, knows that you're doing right. And yet the Bible itself says the heart is deceitful above all things. How do you explain that? 
People are going people go out of their way to try to get the Bible to work for them when we should be working for the Bible. You know? That's why I'm doing this for me. That's why I'm trying to figure it out for myself. And then the coughing starts. Oh, man. I know. I know. That's the... I should probably just stop and save this for later. Okay. We're going to try to get through this. <clears throat> it's just that one part in the back of my throat. It's just so raw. Um, I have taken some medicine, though. And I don't want to I don't want to take a cough drop because cough drops tend to make it worse. So we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Oh, please, God, I ask you for healing. Oh, please, in the name of Christ, heal my throat so I can talk. Okay. <clears throat> so starting back up at the top. Remember, we're, we're reading this just to be able to figure all of this out for ourselves. If anybody wants to come along with me, then hey, yeah, that's great. And if you disagree with me, and if you think that you can, you know, if there's something that I'm missing, then by all means, tell me, and I will hunt it out for myself. And if I can find it, and you're right, then I, I will be more than happy to change. <clears throat> so, the sin of Judah is written with a pin of iron. And with the point of a diamond, it is graven upon the table of their hearts and upon the horns of your altars. Graven upon the table of their hearts, it is written into their hearts so much as you would carve <clears throat> carve woods or car blah, blah, carve words into stone. It is not coming out. The sin of Judah is so graven upon their heart that it cannot be wiped away. Whilst your children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. So it's not only on their hearts, but of course it's upon the horns of the altars. What is the horns of the altars? Well, that's why we have the concordance with us right here too. Uh, corners, the corners. So it is written on the corners of the altars. Whilst your children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. <clears throat> what trees do they like to use? Well, they like to use the green trees on top of the hills. What are the green trees on top of the hills? Those are the evergreens. I've talked about this several times. We still don't know exactly why. Um, possibly because the pine cone um, is a very interesting uh, seed covering. There's seeds inside of the pine cones. And what happens is the pine cones will either open or close <clears throat> depending upon the weather in order to protect the seeds. Um, which is very interesting. I, I never knew that until I started, you know, trying to research these things. Because, you know, you talk about the pineal gland, and it looks like a pine cone. It's a protective 
shell for the gland inside of your, you know, it's your third eye. <clears throat> Which some people actually claim is an actual eye. Like, you know, it's it has the ability to see in its own way. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I'm not going to get too far into that. I just remember somebody was, was saying, like, you know, it actually has... sight capabilities it's the it's the um the surrounding shell over top of it is the thing that they talk about being hardened and calcifying through fluoride i don't know if it's true or not <clears throat> but that's part of this whole this whole thing is you know the pineal gland and the pine cone and this pine cone worship, this pine tree worship, this evergreen tree worship, the, you know, they worship the evergreen tree because it's the one tree that lasts all year round. It's the one tree that doesn't die out. And <clears throat> those are the trees on the hills. Those are the trees that they go and they cut out because they're afraid of death. I've talked about this before, too. Is they're afraid of dying because to them, death is an end. There is no... There is no better place for them. They say there is. But for most of them, this is their best life. It's what you hear all the time. You're leading your best life here. I mean, you're not living your best life here. I'm I'm doing my best to live my best life in the next life. The one that I get to live with Christ in a better way, in a better place. I get to live it with God. I get to live it, it for eternity. I'm not living my best life here. Trust me, if this was my best life, ooh, <laughs> this is terrible. I've already ruined it. <clears throat> but they worship anything that is able to outlast the winter, outlast the cold and the darkness, because they are constantly worried that their, their sun is going to go away. But those are the trees. When it talks about the trees in the groves and the high places, they go out to the groves they worship in front of these trees. They worship the trees themselves. The, the whole the whole deal. You talk about the Bohemian Grove. And you talk about the altars that are out there. And I mean, this is... Again... Jeremiah points out a lot that happens now. That we need to pay attention to. Verse 3. Oh, my mountain in the field... <clears throat> O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, and thy high places for sin throughout all thy borders. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Which yet again... um. It has said this several times, not only in Jeremiah, but in Isaiah, where it says that when they come and they take over your lands, they take over your wealth, your property, everything, they will send you to a place that you've never seen before. Where is this place that we've never seen before? Well, if you follow history, this place you've never seen before that we didn't even know about was across the ocean. Now, either... Either they crossed from the Middle East over to America, and they settled in America, and they served in a land that was not theirs, or, as we've said before, maybe it's backwards, and we say it's possibly backwards because we don't know what lies to believe anymore, because there were... Remnants of Egyptians, remnants of the cultures <clears throat> of Egypt in America 
they either went one way or they went the other way. Some people say, you know, maybe it started in Africa and they were they were dragged up north. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. We can't trust our own history. Somebody was even saying... Somebody's even saying that, um... I wish my throat would quit. And somebody was saying that it even sounds like being dragged down to, like, Australia. You know? Like, there was absolutely nothing out there, and they got dragged down there. I, d I don't know. I can't tell you 100% for certain. Um, my theory has been, and probably always will be until I hear something else, that they were either dragged from the Middle East to America, or from America back to the Middle East. There were cultures that lived in America way before anything that we know. We are told that, you know, everybody was just isolationists and they they all just stayed in their spots. The only people that ever, um, the only people that ever went anywhere apparently were Native Americans. Those were the only ones that decided, hey, let's go ahead and cross the, the land bridge in the north and then spread down into North America and South America. Those are the only people that said, hey, well, let's move around. Let's see what happens. But we find out that they were building places, worshiping gods, worshiping symbolism that was exactly the same as ancient Assyria, as ancient Mesopotamia, as... Um, even Greek to a certain point, um, Egyptian, uh, Sumerian, all these old ancient cultures, they found their way over into North and South America. That was one of the, one of the field trips that we took over to Cahokia. That's when I found out, yeah, they're, it's almost exactly the same kind of stuff. <clears throat> There's a reason for it that our history has purposely lied to us about that we're still trying to figure out what's going on but I think that has something to do again with the land that you know not I don't know exactly how it works and I don't know the time frame but something happened something's going on there there's I can't quite put it together. I've put some of the pieces together, but I can't put all the pieces together into to one coherent you know, storyline. But we're trying to figure it out. And a lot of people disagree with it, and hey, that's cool. You know, that's fine. When you start getting into to things that are outside the Bible, like history and stuff, you know, there's a lot of people who can disagree with a lot of things. And, um... <clears throat> You know, you can point to a million different places and say, well, see, this book says this and this book says that. And it's like, yeah, but how many times was that book rewritten by man? You got to remember the history of this world is written by the winners of the wars. And a lot of the wars were not won by good people. You know, we still live under, live under this, uh, it's almost a dictatorship of lot. Oh, excuse me. I had a hiccup of lies. That's a lot of stuff we can get into later. <clears throat> we need to keep going though before my throat burns itself out again. Uh, verse five. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, and shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, 
and shall not see when heat come when heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall cease from yielding fruit all right so back up to verse 5 thus saith the lord cursed be the man cursed be the man that that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the lord <sighs> for all those people out there that there's this politician worship <laughs> Whether it be one guy or another guy, everybody just it just seems to be on a on a kick of oh, if we can just elect such and such, we'll be great. It'll be amazing. We won't have any more troubles. Oh, this is such a Bible believing politician. You know, he will be able to bring God back into the world. There is nothing in your Bible that says that God wants you to pick your own rulers. Actually, it's quite the opposite. God says if you pick your own rulers, you will be falling into a hole that will lead you to destruction. Because you're not trusting in God, you're trusting in another man. Right here, it says the same exact thing. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. whose heart departeth from the Lord. Do not ever trust in any man in this world. Don't even trust me. I'm not out here trying to convince anybody to do anything. I'm just trying to speak the word. And if you hear it, you hear it. If I can convince one person to go look into it for themselves, hey, that's great. But cursed be the man that trusteth in man, not God. Remember, we um, in the Psalms it talked about the men that were in high places, the kings, the rulers, the 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 people at the top in this world, they were the ones that were laying snares and traps for all of the, for all of God's people. The people on the high end, because they understand that God's word says nothing about following anybody other than God. There's nothing in the Bible that says anything about being ruled over. God sent us king because the people wanted a king, but he sent a fair and righteous king that, that ruled less than what you would actually think a, a king would rule as. But he said, I will send you one that will be a judge over you. He was less a king, more of a judge. Because God said, don't trust in a man. Don't ever put your faith in another man. Always keep it with me. Verse 6, For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. He shall not see when good cometh. Only when evil cometh. What's the, uh, there was another line. Oh, and it was fairly close to where we were, too. About, oh, where was it? No, no, it wasn't even in here. It was, uh, I think it was a psalm. I, I, I was on Facebook. It was one of the Facebook memories that I just had a little while ago. It was... Oh, man. It's something along the lines of... It 
I'm losing it now. My brain is not working anymore. I'm looking. Hold on. There it is. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. When you put the worst men in power, when you exalt the worst men, the wicked will walk on every side. Is that they will not see any good, and they, they will not keep any good around them. They will only keep evil and darkness and wickedness. Which, again, we have seen that over and over is evil snowballs. It just gets worse and worse and worse. It never gets any better. Evil never takes a break, never takes a time out. It always gets worse. They always want a little bit more. They always want to push a little bit more. You take one thing and then tomorrow they're going to want something else and want something else. And next thing you know, it's all falling apart. That is the... same thing as that cursed be the man that trusteth in a man he shall not see when good cometh uh, verse 7 blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You will be a perfectly planted tree that will never have to worry about conserving water in order to survive. That's exactly what that says. You put your trust in a man, and a man will exist in a wilderness, a salted land where nothing can grow, you will judge them by their fruits, so there would be nothing there that will grow that will be worth anything. And it will all be garbage. But if you trust in the Lord, you will be fruitful. You will grow, and you will not have to worry about any problems. It's beautiful words. Huh? It's, what can I say? It's, it's written right here. Verse 9, this is the big one. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, at, and at the end shall be a fool. So now the, there's a lot of pilkros in here. I'm I'm not gonna lie. It's it's like big and small, big and small. But then you get like the 15 or no 19. From like 19 until the end, is there's nothing. So we'll go back up to verse nine. Again, this is the one that somebody was writing on Twitter. Where he was saying, you know, are you supposed to follow your heart? Is there anything in the Bible whatsoever that tells you that you are supposed to follow your heart to get the things of this world? So that's what a lot of people in this world say. You know, well, what should I do? Well, follow your heart. What, is, what does God want me to do? Well, follow your heart. He'll let you know. No. I haven't seen it. If it's in the Bible, I would like to see it. But there's nothing I've seen so far that says to follow your heart in this world for the things that you want. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Above all things, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Wow. I mean, that just... 
that within itself just makes you think there might not be any good people anywhere. Hell, that's, you know, the desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Only God gets to judge the hearts. Remember, I can't judge anyone. You can't judge anyone. Not in this earth. The Bible does say that when um, when the judgment day comes, the saints will be there beside God, helping to judge the sinners. There will be, what do you want to call it? Not a council so much as there will just be all of those that have been chosen shall be there beside him and they will be helping him judge righteously. But there is only one true word above it all. And that is God. In this world, he most definitely is the one that searches the hearts that tries every heart to see if the person is worth pulling into, you know, pulling, pulling them into a relationship with him because some people's hearts, where was it at? Go back here. Some people's hearts in verse one, the sin of Judah is written with a pin of iron and with the point of a diamond, it is graven upon the table of their hearts. It is written into their heart. Their sin is written into their heart like a diamond into rock that it cannot be moved. It cannot be pulled out. It's so bad that they cannot be redeemed out of it. Everybody can ask for it. And he can unburden your heart. He can he can un, he can unstiffen your neck, so that you can be turned. But he is the judge, and he is the judge that that will try men's hearts. Sorry if you heard that. That was I my nose. Um. even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. It's either good fruit or bad fruit. Remember that. It goes to the same way as the, um, the trusting in man for an evil man will be, you know, he will... Anyone that trusts, trusts in man will fall into the place where... It will be like a tree growing in the wilderness, growing in a salted place where nothing can grow. Trust in God, again, you will grow right beside a river where you will not have to worry about water, food, anything. And that your tree will grow perfect throughout the whole year. Um, where are we at? of his doings. Verse 11, as the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth, 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 hatcheth them not. Wow. So he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at the end at his, and at his end shall be a fool. So he that getteth riches and not by right not in good ways shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool we're talking about thieves well, not just talking about thieves we're talking about those that also practice usury as well those are not right ways usury goes against the law of God there, there are actually a lot of a lot of things that bankers do 
that go against the law of God. You know, you can borrow money. I had another little coughing fit there. You can borrow money and you can borrow things from your neighbor and you can do the whole deal. And you can pay it back, but after so many years, God says, you know, if they can't pay it back, then the debt is over. You know, it is what it is. But so many, so many places now, they want to, they want to give you so many terms that, you know, a 30 year, 30 year loan, that's your entire life. That's absolutely slave note bondage. That's. And one of the things that, uh, New Testament says is debt is slavery. Debt is slavery in this world. Just things to understand, concepts to understand of this world, how this world works, how they have tricked us all into being slaves. Because some people don't understand that. And, you know, there's other people that don't. They're like, oh, no, that's not the way anything works. I mean, well, it's, no, it's they've they've tricked you pretty well. It's it's one of the reasons why I understand that, you know, this this whole thing is a lie because they've tricked us all pretty well. They've they found a way to really nail it to us without us really knowing that's it's pretty bad when you really get down behind and underneath the uh the rules that they set out against us to hurt us and manipulate us and destroy us. It's pretty crazy stuff. That's a video for another time. Uh, verse 12. <clears throat> a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Back up to 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. From the beginning. It is his throne. Earth is just the footstool to the throne. His, foot, his throne was there before the footstool was there. There was nothing, and he just said, let it be. Sure enough, there's the earth. You got to remember, that's what it says. It's his footstool. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. I don't really have to go into it that much. It's self-explanatory. 15. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, Neither have I desired the woeful day, thou knowest. That which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me, thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil, and destroy them with double destruction. It's a lot of self-explanatory stuff going on here too, but we'll do it again. Verse 15. Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Which we saw in... Was it 16? Where... God told Jeremiah 
Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, God of Israel, this is uh, 16.9. Behold, I will cause a cease out of your place of your eyes, the voice of mirth, voice of gladness. I will take all of these things away from you because you're not listening to me. Because you have chosen evil instead of good. And verse 10 And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all the great evil against us? Why is God coming against us? Why is why are these things happening? There's another place I remember before, I think it was in Isaiah, where they were saying all these things are falling apart. Where is God now? Why why is this happening? Why is this why have all these things fallen upon us? Well God warned you. <laughs> God God gave you the warning, just like everybody else. You know, his his word has always been there. It's not like you didn't miss it. It's that you chose not to listen. Where is that again? Well, behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. I mean, where, you know, we didn't hear it before, but now things are starting to fall apart. Where, where is it now? We, you know, we need the help. We need the, the helping hand of God. Why isn't it come right this second? Why, why haven't we been healed immediately? You know, we came to, we came to the church. Why am I not getting all the riches and the fame and the wealth and the fortune and everything that I was promised? Where are all these things at? Well, if God's not delivering right away, then well, maybe God's not real. Maybe I shouldn't be here trying to worship God that doesn't do all these things for me. That's how they get you. There's nothing that you're promised from God other than love, protection, eternal life, being washed away from sins, being judged righteously. He will give you the land of milk and honey. The, the fields that you can raise cattle like the sands of the of the ocean, whatever it is, you know, whatever it said. Um, have all of these places. Have the love of, of family, you know, generations of family. Create all these all these things. But you had to have followed him first. You had to have listened to his word. You, know, we, you can always come back to him. But when times get tough, and you're just going to sit there and ask, God, where were you? God's going to say, well, I was right here. Where were you? You were off going, playing around with other gods, playing around with the things of this world, putting your trust in a man, not putting your trust in me. That's what God says. In the verse 16, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day thou knowest. That which came out of my lips was right before thee. Be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me. But let not me be, be confounded. Let them be dismayed. But let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil. And destroy them with double destruction. <clears throat> That's another one of those pray for your enemy kind of things. And it's like, well, meh. <laughs> there's, there's a couple places in Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, I don't know if, if he was speaking out of turn or not, but I can tell you that there are times in other books where 
in the Psalms, we talked about the dancing and singing when the when the evil ones are thrown into the lake of fire. And there's dancing and singing. Um, we've talked about the psalm. There's a time for love. There's a time for hate. There's a time of war. For war, there's time for peace. There's a time for love and a time for hate. There's a time for the righteous to pray that the unrighteous go away. I think one of the things that modern pastors, the soft words, have spoken to us, have said, well, you should tolerate as much as you can without without praying for righteous judgment. You know, God can give everyone righteous judgment, but you should tolerate people until God decides to God decides to judge them. It's nothing about tolerating anybody. You don't let evil come into your house and tolerate it. You tell evil and wickedness to get out of your house. You tell it. You expose it. You you expose the evil and the wickedness. And then you walk away from it. There's nothing about tolerating anything. It's one of the... Something I've personally seen in my life. Is... So many... So many good Bible believing Christians that, you know, they want to tell me how wicked and evil my life is. And yet they will tolerate because of family, because of traditions, because of. Because they think that they are honoring God in whatever way they are, they will tolerate evil and darkness. And you see it. You see it when they do it, and you're just thinking, how could you even remotely judge me for one thing when you are doubly sinning for what you're doing? You don't get to do that. It doesn't work like that. And you ought to go back and, and crack your Bible open again and, and really understand what's going on here. <clears throat> I do my best not to judge anybody. If I'm in somebody else's house, then I, you know. But if it comes in my house, I have to stop it. I have to say something. You don't get to come into my house and spread your evil and darkness around. I don't care who it is. I have, I have actually pushed away family. Because they've come into my house and they've said some things. And I'm like, take that evil out of here. Take that evil and darkness out of my house. And they don't come back. It's, it's sad. It's sad that they won't even hear me out for it. But... This is what it is. What are you going to do? I mean, what, what can you do? Really? You know? It, Does that make me a bad person? Just, just, uh, just a question. Does it make me a bad person? I don't consider myself a bad person. I consider... I consider myself a... man of God that's just trying to keep himself clean. Trying to spread some kind of truth to others. trying to make other people understand that we've been lied to for so long that just darkness abounds and it just gets worse every single day verse 19 this is a long one so I'm going to be talking for a second until we have to come back to it verse 19 thus said the Lord unto me go and stand in the gate of the children of the people whereby the kings of Judah come in and by the which they go out, 
and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah. <coughs> I didn't catch that one in time. Sorry, guys. Verse 20 again. And say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do ye any work, but hollow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the Sabbath day, to do no work therein. Then shall then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, from the places about Jerusalem, and from the land of Benjamin, and from the plain, and from the mountains, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings, and sacrifices, and meat offerings, and incense, and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, Then will will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Okay. So... That last one hurt. That last cough hurt. Let's go back up to 19. We'll take this nice and slow. Let me take a drink. We'll take this nice and slow. So verse 19. Thus said the Lord of God. Thus said the Lord unto me. Thus said the Lord unto me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. And say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that enter in by these gates. It's pretty self-explanatory. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow hallow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. Which... Which I have already admitted to that I am not perfect on keeping the Sabbath. And that is mostly because there are so many different... so many different people that have so many different ways that tell me how to do it. At best, Saturday is just a day of rest. That's that's what I, I try to do. 
as much as I can. I'm sure there's more that should be done. That's why I'm learning. That's why we should all be in learning. Somebody once said that doing it on Sunday is just fine as well because when the what was it the second temple was built that um, there was a bunch of men that were burying some dead and they came to uh, was it David or Daniel I don't remember who it was and they were they were saying that um, <clears throat> you know we're we can't we can't do the feasts because you know we're dead or we were we were burying some dead and we have to be separated from the people for like seven days so we can't do it so um, he went and prayed to God and God said well then tell them when they're ready they can do it. <clears throat> and somebody said that gives you an out to be able to worship God on Sundays. I don't I don't think that's right. I don't know. Um what I can tell you though is that people have gone out of their way to make Sundays as far against the Bible as possible. Remember, we talk about getting dressed up in your Sunday best. Uh, going and sitting in the best places in the church. Doing it for vanity. <clears throat> and then going out and having your Sunday your Sunday dinner. Your Sunday meal. usually has to do with eating some kind of pork. Um, but the whole thing. I don't like that. Personally, I don't like that. I know that I should I, I I know that I should keep the Sabbath better than I do. And I've said I, I admit that I don't keep it perfectly. It's hard to know how to keep it perfectly because we've been lied to about everything. But it's also hard to know. It's like I said, I can ask three different people and I get three different responses. How I'm supposed to do it. How you're supposed to do it. So at best, <clears throat> I can just stay home and not do work and pray to God. Ask him what he wants me to do for him. So it's usually what I do. Ask him what he wants me to do for him. <clears throat> that way I know that I'm just, you know, I'm not just taking a day for myself. Now again, other people can do it in other different ways. Um, I think more than anything else, though, what we need to be talking about here is Jeremiah is pointing out to us that we should be following a Sabbath. You know, somebody said that... Um, Ten Commandments, it doesn't say, you know, keep the Sabbath. It says, remember the Sabbath. Somebody, you know, everybody likes to say, well, you know, Christ only talked about nine commandments whenever he was, <clears throat> whenever he was on earth. He never talked about the Sabbath. Well, it's because it says, remember the Sabbath. Keep it in mind, always. He didn't have to worry about 
commanding people to, to follow the Sabbath whenever he was here because he was keeping it himself constantly. All the apostles, all the apostles kept the Sabbath constantly. And you have to, uh, you have to understand that's part of it. God wants you to take a day to rest. He wants you to take a day to rest and to have a day where you and he get together. Where you you not only worship God but that he can talk to you tell you what he needs from you so you understand the words that he says things that he wants I'm going to keep going though <clears throat> keep going there's a lot of action going on in the house and my throat is getting worse um we can always come back to the sabbath you know we could always come back and talk about the sabbath as we go again i'm not perfect don't take my word for it and if you go and talk to others it's like i said you will hear three different things from three different people on what you should be doing on the sabbath I have not found anything that's perfect. I have talked to a lot of people about the Sabbath, trying to figure out what I should be doing. And <clears throat> at best, like I said, at best, it is what God wants me to do. It is trying to keep a day for what he wants for me, not what I want, what he wants. But others will have an opinion, and I'm sure that others will speak their opinion, because that's what people do. <clears throat> Just know that I am not, I am not a perfect person. Anyways, um, verse 23, but they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their, nef their neck stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instructions, nor receive instructions. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, and bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the Sabbath sabbath day to do no work therein then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of david riding in chariots and on horses they and their princes the men of judah and the inhabitants of jerusalem and this city shall remain forever it is simply him saying keep a day for me Diligently hearken unto me. Do not make your neck stiff. Receive instruction. Obey. Just listen. And you will receive these things. And they shall come from the cities of Judah, and from the places about Jerusalem, and from the land of Benjamin, and from the plain, and from the mountains, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meat offerings, and incense, and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hollow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour your places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. <clears throat> yet again there's a lot going on there and we have 
we have had the true understanding of what a Sabbath day even remotely is. It has been hidden from us. And simply following the word, it is just taking a day off and worshiping God, just listening to him. Not burdening other people as much as you can. Not burdening other people, not falling for the sins of this world, not um, not doing the wickedness of this world. There's more to it. Again, there's more to it. And yes, I will have people that will come to me and say, well, see, you've got to do this, and you got to do this, you got to do that. <clears throat> Just like I was having. It's like, okay, but then this other guy over here, well, they're wrong. Well, they say you're wrong. So which one is it? I can't put my faith in man. I can't put my trust in man to tell me what's up. I have to trust in... I have to trust in God. I have to trust in God's word to tell me what's up. So I said, don't listen to me. If you think that I am either blaspheming or a false teacher or anything because I don't know it perfectly, then that is fine. I'm just going to sit here and keep talking. I'm not here to change anybody's doctrine. I'm here to speak the truth and find the truth. And boy, we we find it constantly. Over and over and over again, we find something new. Yeah, when it comes to the Sabbath, though, I'm not perfect by any means. I do feel I should be doing more. And I've asked the Father what more I should be doing. And I'll tell you what, at, at, at best, or at worst, he tells me just to stay home. Just stay home. Pray. Make a video if you want to. It's what he's told me. I don't know what he tells anybody else. You know, He tells other people, hey, go out into a church with other people and worship and sing songs and do all the things. That's great. He hasn't convicted me to do that yet. He hasn't convicted me to do much anything yet. <clears throat> he convicted me to make videos. So, you know, somebody else could probably say, well, see, you, you, you just don't have the true spirit of the Lord in you yet. You know, you've got to be convicted of all these things. I don't, you don't know that. You don't know that. I don't know that. None of us really do know that. We're all on our own separate journeys. Remember this. You cannot get onto a brother for being on a on a specific part of his journey. If it is not for that for that brother in faith to be at a certain point, then that's on him. His journey is not your journey. You can help him and instruct him, but you cannot judge him for it. Because he's on his own journey. He's on his own path. We all take our own paths. We all have to... We all have to... Find our way... On that narrow path. We're not all... We're not all exactly the same. And... Everybody's at their own stages, their own levels. Some people are getting, some people are still getting milk. Some people have been doing this for five years and they're still just getting the milk. They're not even touching the meat yet. Some people have been doing this for 20, 30 years and they got all the meat. And all they ever want to do is just give people meat and it just drives people away because nobody's ready for that. So, with that in mind, my dogs are down there barking. 
My wife is awake. Dogs are down there barking. They're uh, they're having a good old time. I'm gonna go see how they're doing. My wife had a coughing fit this morning. Hopefully she's doing all right. It's the cleaning out process after a cold that sucks. It's the worst part. I hate it. It's like you get sick for a week and then you have like a week of like cleaning out. It's, just, ugh. it's terrible. Anyways, guys, I will uh, talk to you all later. God bless every one of you. Take care of yourselves. We're trying to figure our way through this, right? All right. I shall talk to you all later.